Great. So like I said, uh, I want to talk a little bit today about imaging and, and clearing organoids. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Great. So I am by no means an expert in spheroids and organoids. That is all of you people. I just image them a lot. Um, so I stole this slide from a nature review. Um, I think this is actually from the Arlotta lab. And um, most of you know this far better than I do, but basically um, spheroids and organoids are 3D culture models. Uh, so you can start from some type of stem cell and begin to differentiate it into whatever tissue you're interested in. Um, these start to grow in these little clumps inside your dish or inside a roller, and they can be differentiated into different types of tissue, whatever you're interested in, and they come in many different shapes and sizes. Um, and to be honest with you, I, don't, I can tell you the, the difference between a spheroid and an organoid. Um, from what I've seen, organoids are usually bigger, um, and I guess they have more different types of differentiation inside them. But basically what we're often dealing with here is um, a big ball of cells that are supposed to be a 3D model of some sort of um, tissue type. So, of course, um, whenever we start doing 3D imaging, we run into this uh, in light microscopy, we run into this problem of light scatter. So this is just a really rough diagram of a fluorescence microscope here. So we have your organoid sitting down here, this big gray rectangle. And what we're going to do is we're going to shine in some sort of excitation light onto that sample. We've got a fluorescent molecule here, this green star somewhere on the inside that's going to excite that molecule to give off fluorescence. And then that fluorescence is um, going to travel back up into our microscope and reach our detector so that we can get an image. Now the problem here is that this excitation light, as it goes into the tissue, when it starts hitting um, different refractive index mismatches through that tissue, that light starts bouncing all over the place. So that makes it difficult for this excitation light to get to our fluorescent molecule here. Now, in general, this isn't really that big of a problem because all we do is we just keep turning up the power on that laser until our laser light reaches our fluorophor. The bigger problem is getting that fluorescence light back out of the sample. And the reason for that is, is obviously in comparison to the laser, this is much weaker. Um, that fluorescence light goes in all directions, but only some of it is going to get captured by our, uh, our objective up here. And if we're using a confocal, some of the light that comes from this point, if it scatters around in here, it can actually get blocked at our pinhole as well. So we even some of that light that did get into our objective ends up getting blocked by our pinhole. So um, it's really difficult the deeper and deeper we go into this tissue to get this light back to our detector. And here's just a couple examples of that. This isn't from an organoid. This is actually from a piece of brain tissue. Um, but this is just looking at the same thing with uh, a one photon excitation, which is just traditional confocal, and two photon. And you can see that we can't go very deep at all, less than 100 microns um, with a typical confocal microscope. So just to show you what that looks like in an organoid, um, here's a spherical organoid. This one's about 300 micrometers in diameter. And what you can see is you start imaging through that organoid. Things look okay until you get to a certain point and you can see the inside starts disappearing and you don't see anything there anymore. That's because out on the edge here, that fluorescence coming from the edge still doesn't have to pass through very much tissue, but the stuff that's in the middle has to go all the way up through all of these cells to get back to the detector. And so at some point, um, usually about halfway through your organoid, once you start coming down on the other side where it starts narrowing in again, uh, you lose all of your signal. So 
what you often see is you can image about half of your organoid or your spheroid. Um, and even that half let you image has a big empty core in the middle. And this is really, um, this can lead to a big artifact. A lot of people will say, oh, I've got a necrotic core. All the cells are dead. There's nothing left in the middle. And that's not true at all. You could have all kinds of living cells in the middle there. You just can't see them because that light's not getting out. So it's really important to um, take this into consideration and think about what's going on when we're actually imaging and make sure we're choosing the right technique and the right technology to do this. So I said organoids and spheroids can come in many, many different sizes. So I've seen them on the order of 100 micrometers um, all the way up to multiple millimeters. And depending on where we are in the spectrum, that's going to dictate what type of technology um, we're going to use on the imaging side, as well as what we're going to have to do on our sample prep side. So what I want to do is um, walk through each one of these situations. So we're going to start with something small and work our way up to really big organoids and talk about which microscopes um, are best suited to these. Uh, so here's just a bit of an introduction. You can see what's going to be on the way. Um, and then we're also going to talk about some sample prep techniques as well, like sectioning and clearing, um, which are going to be needed once you get to these um, larger, larger points. Cool. So if we go back to this example right here, um, like I said, this organoid is actually about 300 uh, micrometers in diameter. But if this was about 100 micrometers or less, um, there's a good chance that we could image this on a standard confocal. Now, if it was just a uh, 100 micrometer slab of brain tissue that we had cut, or even a couple hundred micron zebrafish, we'd have no problem imaging through it with our regular confocal. The one thing that's really difficult about organoids is they're incredibly dense and they scatter like crazy. I've never seen a tissue that scatters as badly as um, some of these uh, organoids and spheroids, um, well, other than adipose tissue. But um, So they can be very, very difficult to work with. But in general, if they're less than 100 micrometers in diameter, you're probably going to be able to image through them all the way without doing anything special. Um, just with a standard confocal. So there's a couple options for that. Obviously, we have both inverted confocals and upright confocals in the facility. For something like this, I would strongly encourage you to use the upright confocal. And I'll give you a couple of reasons for that. One is our inverted confocals um, all work with cover slip corrected objectives. So what this means is you're going to have to take your organoid, you're going to have to get one of those cover slip bottom dishes or chambers, which are really expensive. You're going to have to mount your sample as close as you can to that cover glass. And then depending on how thick it is, um, you aren't going to have a lot of options objective wise. So a lot of times what we end up using is a low magnification air objective here. And that can pose a lot of issues. So one, it has a low numerical aperture, so you're not going to gather as much light. Your image is going to be dimmer. You're going to lose contrast. The other is this refractive index difference um, between the air objective and your organoids probably sitting in PBS or some sort of buffered water solution. That refractive index mismatch is going to create an axial imaging artifact when you image. So your round spheroid is actually going to come out looking like a pancake piece of tissue, uh, unless you do some sort of correction for it. So again, we have a couple videos up on our YouTube channel about dealing with that refractive index mismatch. And Aaron has a paper coming out in a couple of weeks in Nature Protocols, um, where you can dig much deeper into this if, if this is something you're dealing with right now, imaging through refractive index mismatch. Now, if we go to one of our upright confocals, we can grab these water dipping objectives that we have, which are awesome because they have a nice um, low magnification, which gives you a really big field of view. Uh, if you're dealing with 100 micron organoids, you can get it, um, multiple organoids into a single field of view. They have a really long working distance, so you never have to worry about not being able to get through the organoid or running into the organoid or crushing the organoid. 
Um, and you don't have to worry about cover slips. All you do is just take a regular old Petri dish. Um, because these have a really wide diameter, we usually suggest at least a six centimeter diameter Petri dish, but just a standard plastic one, very cheap and expensive. And just mount your organoids in a thin layer of agarose on the bottom of this dish. Um, and with that, we just put them underneath this objective and image away. This has a numerical aperture of 1.0. Uh, so it's a really high numerical aperture. You're going to get great resolution. You're also going to capture a lot of signal, get a really nice bright image. So um, whenever you're taking these organoids onto a confocal to image, we highly recommend you doing this with an upright confocal. Okay. So what happens when you get just outside of that 100 micrometer cutoff? Um, so again, the issue with that 100 microns is that that's about the limit for uh, light scatter. And if you go much thicker than that, I mean, oftentimes you can't even get quite there. Um, but you're going to start to see that uh, dark core where you're not penetrating the light in the inside. And you're only going to be able to image about halfway through that, that tissue. So one of the options that you can do to actually double that penetration depth uh, is to move to our light sheet microscope. So the light sheet microscope has this unique mounting um, system where we would actually pull your organoids into a glass capillary tube that's been filled with agarose. And we mix the organoids into the agarose, pull that into that tube, allow it to harden, and then we can extrude, extrude the agarose. Um, out of the tube here and suspend your organoids inside the imaging chamber here. And now what we do is we shoot our excitation light in the form of a thin sheet through our organoid, which is going to create some fluorescence, which is then going to get captured by this objective at the back here. And um, again, for organoids of this size, that objective is going to be the exact same one I just showed you on that last page. So it's that 20x objective that gives you a nice big field of view, a nice long working distance. And it also gives you a high numerical aperture, so you're getting good resolution, good contrast. Um, but because of this unique mounting structure with this tube, we're actually able to rotate our sample. So what that means is that we can actually image through our sample from multiple angles, and then put all those angles back together again. So you can imagine if my organoid is sitting here, and I move the sample through the light sheet, uh, the side of the organoid that's closest to the objective, I'm going to get a really good image, but that image is going to degrade and it's going to get worse and worse um, the deeper I go into that organoid. But then if I rotate it 180 degrees, I can now image that side that I had the terrible image with really high quality, um, and then I can combine those two views together. And it doesn't have to just be two views, we can do this for multiple views. And you can see through this simulation on the bottom that the more views that you do, uh, the better your image becomes. So um, this is the same, to some degree, the same principle as a um, CT scanner, that the more points you image from around your sample, the better your image is gonna get. Okay. Cool, so that essentially allows us to double our imaging depth now. So now we're getting up closer to 200 microns. Um, and we can stack multiple organoids within this uh, agros column, and we can get a little bit of uh, some decent throughput to it. Okay. So um, another option when you need to image a little deeper, and I apologize, I didn't have an image of an organoid for this. This is actually a pollen grain. But another option is to move to our two photon microscope. So uh, a lot of you are familiar with two photon microscopes and the idea that this allows you to image deeper in, into live tissue. These are what have been traditionally used for doing in vitro imaging and live and uh, awake animals. Um, and what we're using here is infrared light that can penetrate nice and deep into our sample. And we um, restrict the excitation to a very small point. So now we don't have to worry about a pinhole on our return, our return path to our detector. So we can gather a lot more light on the way back. And this allows us to image a lot deeper. So this is just a comparison of imaging the same uh, pollen grain uh, 
with wide field confocal and two photon. And this is really small, it's only about 30 microns deep. But uh, you can see with wide field, obviously we have all this out of focus light um, and hazy background that we get rid of when we use confocal. We get actual nice clean optical sections. But you can see the spikes on this side of the pollen grain, this is the side closest to the objective, are obviously nice and clear and well defined. Whereas when we get to the opposite side of it, they're a lot more blurred out and more difficult to see. However, if we use that two photon microscope, you can see we have pretty much equivalent contrast and resolution uh, image quality on both sides of that pollen grain. Um, this is just this design of this microscope allows us to go a lot deeper. So how deep can you go? Um, in theory, the theoretical limit of a two photon microscope is about one millimeter. Uh, in practice, I'd say you're probably gonna get to four or 500 micrometers at most, at best. Um, but this is going to be very sample dependent, depends on how bright your label is, how well your sample is labeled, uh, which fluorescent dye you're using. Obviously, the further you go into the red or the far red, the deeper you'll be able to get. Um, so this is my recommendation. Once you get um, beyond that 100 micron to maybe about 500 micron range, uh, a two photon microscope could be a good option there. Uh, which would allow you to image your organoid intact without doing any pre-processing ahead of time. Okay. Once you get beyond that point, um, uh, the, the imaging depth of a two photon, you're gonna have to do some sort of pre-processing to your sample in order to image it deeper. So this is about the best we can do for a live sample. You're not gonna be going any deeper than this uh, imaging into a live organoid. Um, everything I'm going to show you from here on requires fixing your sample and then um, processing it for, for downstream imaging. So the most obvious method for doing this, um, this is again another figure out of a paper from the Arlotta lab. Um, the most obvious method here is to section. So this is what we traditionally do with large tissues and organs. And we're just going to go ahead and put that tissue on our vibrotome or our microtome and slice it up into thin sections. Once it's been sectioned, um, you then have a couple options. Uh, and this usually comes down to how many sections you have. Uh, if you've got a lot of these, people usually go to our Axio scans first, where you can load um, up to 100 slides in there and really quickly um, image through all of those sections nice and fast. And then if you've got some sections that you're particularly interested in, you want to get a really good high quality image of those, maybe you even want to do some 3D work within that section, depending on how thick the section was, uh, then you can take them over to the confocal. Um, so these images here were all done on our LSM 700 confocal, so not the 880. Okay. So um, if you don't want a section, if you want to try and keep everything intact and in one piece, um, obviously if you want to do 3D work, this is much easier. Um, taking all of those sections and trying to recombine them into a 3D image is uh, quite difficult. Um, also, there's a lot of artifacts that get introduced that way. So uh, a lot of people prefer to turn to clearing. And so the top panel here is that same organoid that I've shown you um, a bunch of times already, that 300 micron organoid when it was uncleared. And this down below is just imaging the exact same organoid after going through a clearing process. And now you can see that you can image through and you can see that signal from the core um, all the way to the halfway point, which is as far as they imaged here. So, um, what clearing is doing is trying to reduce all of those refractive index mismatches that we have throughout our tissue. Um, and it allows you to uh, turn, essentially turn a tissue crystal clear. Again, if you go to our YouTube channel, there are a ton of videos there uh, about tissue clearing and I'll tell you all about the basics of it. So I'm not gonna go into that today. Um, so here's an example. This organoid was, um, I think this was somewhere between 500 microns and a millimeter. I think it was closer to 500. And this is out of the Rubin lab. And so this was a 
cortical organoid and they were trying to differentiate the cells within it into cells that were specific to different cortical layers. Um, so this has been labeled with markers to three different cortical layers. And um, what you can see if you actually cut this open, as we did here, um, you can see that it looks like it was well differentiated into three different layers. So that green marker was mostly on the inside in the core. It was surrounded by the blue marker and then the red marker was out on the outside. Um, and this was something that just, you couldn't see this at all without clearing. All, all you could see was the red marker on the outside. And again, it just looked like you had a necrotic core or something in, in the middle when you really didn't. Um, so this was just done with some simple clearing methods. This was just cubic, I think, um, cubic in scale, uh, nothing overly difficult. So the big question that I'm always asked is which clearing technique should I use? Um, for these samples. And organoids are interesting um, because most often you're doing immunolabeling of them. And one of the biggest barriers to tissue clearing is immunolabeling, uh, just because if you're doing something like a, a mouse brain, that tissue is just so large to get your antibodies to penetrate. You need so much antibody, you need so much time. Um, there's a lot of optimization to be done there and it becomes a major barrier. So, with organoids, because they're most often smaller than that, um, this is no longer as big of an, a barrier and people are more often working with immunolabeling. Immunolabeling is nice because it opens up pretty much any clearing technique to you. Uh, the biggest issue with most solvent-based clearing techniques is that they will quench any fluorescent protein that you have there. So the decision matrix for deciding which tech clearing technique uh, to use as far as um, imaging organoids really comes down to one question. Do you have fluorescent proteins? If you do have fluorescent proteins in your sample and you don't want to immunolabel them, so obviously you can get an anti-GFP and immunolabel um, your fluorescent protein if you, if you quench it doing solvent base. But if you don't want to do that, if you want to image the innate fluorescence of the fluorescent protein, uh, what you're going to do is want to use one of the aqueous based clearing techniques. And most often in the HCBI, what we're using is a clarity technique here. If you don't have a fluorescent protein, then the solvent based techniques are often uh, easier, more robust, and a little more consistent. So if you don't have fluorescent proteins, if you're going to be immunolabeling anyway, I'd point you towards a solvent based technique. Um, there's a few other considerations here. One of them is in the past, we didn't have a really good way to image uh, solvent-based, solvent-cleared solvent cleared samples at really high resolution, but thankfully, thankfully we have some new hardware that does allow us to do that now. Um, the other thing to consider is that solvent-based techniques will generally shrink your sample a little bit. This iDisco Plus one that I've mentioned here is um, pretty good. Uh, you don't get as much shrinkage as some of the other techniques. Whereas aqueous-based techniques, you often get a little bit of expansion with those, so kind of the opposite. But for the most part, it really comes down to this one question. Do you have fluorescent proteins? If yes, go with an aqueous technique. If no, go with a solvent technique. So I just threw out here some really quick, simple, straightforward protocols for clearing. So if you're doing a solvent-based technique, we usually recommend iDisco Plus. And really briefly, what you're going to do is you're going to fix your organoids in paraformaldehyde. Then you dehydrate them going through a methanol gradient. Uh, you dehydrate them into pure methanol. And then you rehydrate them again back into, usually do this into PBS because your antibodies are going to be much happier in PBS than they would be in, say, water. Uh, you'll do your immunostaining just as you normally would, put your primary on, wash it, put your secondary on, wash it. Just again, remember, you're usually dealing with a really thick piece of tissue here. So you're going to have to do three to five days of that primary antibody on your sample. You're going to have to wash it over a couple days. And then you're going to have to do another three to five days with your secondary. So it's not going to be a quick immunostaining process. Uh, once your immunostaining is done, you re dehydrate that sample again. So again, into 100% methanol. And then what you're gonna do is displace that methanol with DCM, dichloromethane. And 
Finally, you're going to use some other solvent to match the refractive index of what's left behind. So with iDisco Plus, this is usually done with DBE. Um, we actually prefer to use ethyl cinnamate now. This is much easier to clean off of our optics. It's a lot safer for you. Um, so this is what we recommend. The only drawback to ethyl cinnamate is if you're doing a four color imaging, the dispersion in ethyl cinnamate is pretty bad. So it can be tough to match that DAPI channel to a far red channel. You're gonna have to do some post-processing there. Um, please do not use BAB. There is no reason to use BAB. These other solvents work just as well, and BAB is very toxic, very destructive, um, and will destroy our equipment. So keep that out of the HCBI. Uh, if you're doing an aqueous-based clarity technique, again, you're going to fix that sample on paraformaldehyde. You're going to embed it in a hydrogel. Uh, you're going to delipify that sample, so get all the lipid out with SDS. You might um, want to speed up this process using one of the electrophoresis chambers we have at the HCBI. If you still need to immunostain, um, you'll do that at this point. And then once your immunostaining is done, you do that final uh, refractive index matching step. And we usually do this with um, this uh, substance called Easy Index, which we buy from a company called Life Canvas here in Cambridge. All right. So, and again, there's some protocols for this on our website. All right, so you've got your sample cleared. Now we've got to figure out how to mount it and put it under the microscope. So again, I'm going to go from thin to thick here. So if you've got those nice thin samples that are less than about 100 micrometers, uh, this is usually done, this prep, prep is usually done for inverted scopes. Um, basically what we do is we take a microscope slide and we take double-sided scotch tape and we just build that up. Uh, you can check online, the scotch tape is usually either 50 microns or 100 microns thick. So you just put on as many layers as you need to match the thickness of your sample. Drop your sample in the middle, surround it with some clearing solution, and then put a cover slip on top that sticks onto the double-sided tape. Um, if that sample is going to be sitting for a while, you can seal the sides around here. Um, one of the best ways to do this is with a, a dental rubber, but you can also do it with nail polish or any sort of type of epoxy. Um, so obviously you do this mounting step after you've done that refractive index matching and you use the same refractive index matching solution that you used at the end as your mounting medium here. For upright scopes, um, we have some different options. So here you can do exactly what I talked about before with the uncleared samples. You can mount them in a little piece of agarose uh, in the bottom of a Petri dish, and then we can just dip the objective in from the top. So again, this works great for upright scopes. This is good for samples up to that 500 micron range. And the tricky thing here is when you do the mounting is going to depend on which clearing technique you use. So if you use the clarity technique, you're going to want to mount these before you do that final refractive index matching step. Okay. Um, so you'll mount them in there in um, agarose, which will be made up in PBS. And then you're going to take all that PBS off and replace it with the clearing solution and do that final clearing step in the Petri dish. Okay. If you're doing this with iDisco, I'll be honest, I haven't tried this yet, but apparently this works. Um, so you obviously do your immunolabeling in PBS, so you could then mount the samples in the bottom um, of the Petri dish at that point. And then you can go through your solvent clearing with the DCM, um, so sorry, with your methanol dehydration, your DCM, and your ethyl cinnamate. Apparently, the hydrogel will still survive that. It's going to shrink, just like your sample is going to shrink. Um, but apparently, things will still stay intact. I haven't tried it myself, so if any of you ever do try that and it's a complete disaster, please let me know. Um, so another option that we have, this works for samples up to about one millimeter in size, is you can order um, a piece of silicone rubber. And you can actually get these in different thicknesses. Um, so I should have mentioned over here, 
this double-sided tape doesn't usually work with uh, solvent-based methods because the solvents slowly eat away at the tape. Um, so this is a great option for solvent-based clearing samples. Uh, so you can buy this, these silicone rubber sheets in different thicknesses, just buy them off Amazon, you get a lifetime supply for 20 bucks. And what you do is cut out this rectangle uh, with another opening in the middle. And then what you're gonna do is um, take some epoxy and just glue that on to your microscope slide, drop your sample in the middle, fill that chamber up with your clearing solution, and then drop um, another bead of epoxy around the top here and put your cover slip on top. And that just gives you a little sealed chamber with your sample inside uh, surrounded by your clearing solution. So again, this works pretty well for things up to about one millimeter. Uh, if you're imaging with our light sheet, we have this little pedestal system. So we have these little metal pedestals in the facility. You just come in, um, put some, actually put this pedestal upside down, spread some crazy glue on the bottom of it, and then just drop your organoid or your tissue right onto it. Give it about 30 seconds for that to cure. And then you can plug this pedestal into the um, stage of the microscope. So again, um, this works for great for imaging, the multi-view imaging of uncleared samples. Um, this can also work, so those are usually in the range of about 200 microns. This will also work really well for very large um, samples, the multi-millimeter size samples. Uh, they actually end up being a lot easier to glue on the end here. Um, so again, you mount this after you've done your clearing and remember that you're gonna have to fill the chamber in the light sheet microscope uh, with some of your refractive index matching solution. If you're using an upright confocal to image, so or a two photon to image, uh, again, we can go back to that Petri dish, just spread some crazy glue on the bottom and stick that sample right on. Once again, you do this after your RI matching step and remember to fill this container with um, your RI matching solution. So one thing that's important here is if you're doing solvent-based clearing, you don't want to use a polystyrene dish. That solvent will melt through it over time. So make sure you do this in a glass dish um, if you're doing solvent-based clearing. Okay. Great. So for imaging these really large samples, um, we have a few more options. So um, once they've been cleared, we can use a regular confocal or we can use a two photon. So if your clearing was okay, but not great, the uh, two photon is probably a better option. Uh, if you have a really sensitive fluorophore in there that's gonna bleach while you're doing that really long Z-stack with a regular confocal, again, you're gonna to wanna to use two photon. Um, but confocal has the advantage of usually giving you a cleaner image and it's much easier to do multicolor imaging. So if you wanna do a four color image, that's much easier to do on confocal than it is with two photon. Yeah. Uh, of course, we can image these in the light sheet, uh, especially now that we have the really nice new light sheet seven optics, which allows to match any refractive index. So uh, it doesn't really matter which clearing solution you use, as long as it's not bad and it's not toxic to us in the microscope. Uh, and this is just an example of some of those optics. So we now have these really great correction colors that allow us to image over a really wide, wide range of refractive indices, um, either in the light sheet or on the upright confocal. So either way, or two photon. So lots of options for the large uh, cleared samples. Great. Cool. So I just, that was everything I wanted to say. I just want to summarize it with this one table at the end here, which I think this is kind of the take home. Um, so like I said, it really depends on how thick or how large your spheroid or organoid is. So if it's less than about 100 microns, you can usually just take that straight to a confocal and without doing any sort of downstream processing or different processing. If it's not, if it's a little thicker, if it's somewhere between 100 and 200, then it's probably best to just go straight to the light sheet and image it with the multi-view function. Uh, again, you don't have to do any special preparation here. If your sample's less than 
about 500 microns and more than 200, you might get lucky and be able to image that with the two photon all the way through without any sample prep. But definitely once you get beyond 500 microns, um, you're gonna have to do some sort of pre-processing step. So this can be sectioning um, with a microtome and then imaging either on our Axio scan, if you're doing it in a high throughput manner, or it could be on one of our confocals. Or this could be clearing. Um, you're gonna clear that sample and leave it intact, and then you're probably gonna image it on the light sheet or a confocal or the two photon, depending on how, how good your clearing is and how many labels you have in there. Great, um, so that is all that I had for today.